afternoon, bonjour, <laughs> hola, uh, <laughs> and uh, g'day and welcome to uh, the latest episode of Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind, the podcast that aims to uh, discuss, dissect and demystify the fascinating and often confusing world of cancer treatment. I'm Michael Fernando and with me is uh, my partner in crime as always, Josh Hurwitz. How are you, Josh? Oh, yeah, not too bad. Happy as the weekend. Yeah, very happy. Did you like my little multicultural introduction there? I'm putting that Duolingo to good use. I did. I was like, where is he going with this? And um, and then he just went French. Very cool. Yep. Then then just went French. When in doubt, go French. That's my motto. Um, <laughs> we have a good, um, a good episode for you today. Uh, it's one that is near and dear to the hearts of many an Australian oncologist because it is the cancer that we have the highest rates of in the world. That's a bit of a strange brag, but it is an important one to know about. And that is, of course, melanoma. So, Josh, I believe you've prepared a little background information packet on melanoma for those uh, of our listeners who might not be as intimately familiar with it as the average Aussie. I have. So um, I guess the first thing to say, we're, we're going to be speaking about metastatic melanoma. So that's that's melanoma that's spread to other parts of the body rather than local. And, you know, melanoma is, I like to say, kind of the, the frontier of the modern era of oncology. Um, but before I talk about that, let's talk The about final that. frontier, some might say. The final frontier. We didn't steal that from anywhere. Um, is that, you know, it's a really common cancer. So in Australia, it is the third most common cancer diagnosed in Australia. In Australia and incidence increases with age um, and also with increasing kind of detection rates because there's a lot more knowledge and understanding and those sorts of things. So overall you know the, the nice thing about melanoma is that surviving at least five years so five years survival was about 92 percent that's with adjuvant or you know when you're cured and also in the metastatic setting now looking at the different stages and i think this is an important thing to talk about i'll talk about risk factors just in a little bit is that you know you can have stage two cancer and have still 80 percent plus five year overall survival, which is amazing. But then when you go down to stage three with these cancers, it actually drops off a fair bit to less than 70%. Now, historically, this was a terrible cancer. So the metastatic setting, we had drugs such as interferon and most of, you know, I've only used this once, but, you know, people who have used this previously can probably attest to the toxicity of this drug and also the, you know, the lack of efficacy. Um, and then comes immunotherapy, which Michael got. I think Michael got the uh, better straw this time to talk about it. And I, we were talking about targeted therapy. But, you know, things started to change probably in the last the five, 10 years. And this is the front runner of these kind of, this new treatment paradigm that we're seeing across most cancers. Um, so to talk about a case, I think is probably something we can talk about. But before I do that, let's just talk about risk factors. And probably one of the reasons Australia um, has, you know, a higher rate. So if you have light skin, if you've got a personal history, 10% of uh, melanomas are actually familial. And, you know, immunosuppression and Parkinson's disease also sort of increase your risk. Um, in regards to a case, let's, let's talk about, you know, you've got a 67-year-old man. He's, he's a surfer. He lives... We'll go Bronte, um, just, just just for the sake, you know, sunshine all the time. Um, anyway, he's he's had a melanoma excised a couple of years back and it's just been on observation. And then he comes into clinic and it's like, I've lost some weight, not feeling too good. And you've done a PET scan and a CT and it shows, you know, widespread disease. You know, he's got cancer in his lungs, he's got cancer in his liver. You're like, oh, God, we, we need to do something to try and treat it. Um, and then you're like, what options? Now... The beautiful thing about this is that it's no longer chemotherapy. Like we, we rarely or if ever use chemotherapy in the first, well, we, we never use chemotherapy in the first line instance. Um, and generally, I think this is what I hand up to Michael because this is immunotherapy at its best. Um, you've probably seen or heard about it on the news for many years, how it melts the cancer, just melts away. And you just see this, you know, person who's really unwell become well, you know, go back to living their life. I've seen 87-year-olds on this treatment that are playing golf and, you know, 
just living a great, having a great time. So Michael, do you want to take it away with your first trial? And I guess the, uh, this pivotal. St- yeah, thanks. That's, um, that's a really good way of describing the impact that immunotherapy has had. I've had, uh, multiple oncologists, I'm sure you have Josh as well saying, Oh, you've grown up in the, uh, in the era of immunotherapy. You don't remember what it was like before we had this. It was such a dark era. Um, like they're, you know, talking about a time before electricity. So it really has completely revolutionized how we changed, um, how we treated, um, uh, how we treated cancers. I guess just as a bit of a background to this study that we'll talk about, obviously we'll link all of these studies in our, the episode description if you want to have a closer look. Uh, but um, the study that I'm going to talk about is Checkmate 067, but before that we'll talk about what immunotherapy is. I think a lot of our listeners will be uh, familiar with the concept, but I think the, the main thing to take away from this concept of immunotherapy is that it doesn't actually treat the cancer itself. It doesn't target the cancer itself. So chemotherapy, we know it's uh, the cytotoxic drugs that directly affect cancer um, by often inducing fatal genetic or DNA strand errors that leads to cell death when the cancer's regulatory mechanisms aren't doing that itself. Immunotherapy, would you believe it? That's something I just knew off the top of my head. I did not Google it in any way, shape or form. Fun facts of Michael. Yes, yes. Fun facts of me. I have all of this stuff sort of just bouncing around in my head. <laughs> so so that's that's the idea of um, immunotherapy. And it works to varying degrees. Um, but the as Josh said, the, the best responses we've seen are really in melanoma. And as I'm sure we'll discuss in a in a later episode, to a lesser extent, renal cell cancer, but melanoma is one of is is the post child for immunotherapy and that's really seen uh best in this checkmate 067 study which has been going and we get about a yearly update and there's a yearly uh Nejim publication about it in uh, uh and it's been going for uh what is it about seven seven and a half years now josh i think yeah, it works out because I think looking at my my timeline, which again, didn't know this off the top of my head, I think Ipi or Ipilimumab, which is one of the drugs you were likely talking about in this trial, I think first came around probably about 2011. Was it 2011? Um, that's that's quite early. Yeah, I'm just looking here. But this was with uh, pegylated interferon, right? So I, I'm assuming they don't do that combination anymore, and I hope not anyway. No, um, pegal- the makers of pegylated interferon have long filed for bankruptcy, I think. <laughs> yes, uh, don't quote us on that, though. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so, like, I think it's been around, and I was working out, you know, our careers. This is kind of when we were in medical school or, you know, just about to finish. So, realistically, unless, yeah, unless you've been in the field for 15-plus years, you know, th- this is the new standard. Yeah, yeah, and, and for good reason. So... Um, Checkmate 067, a double-blind phase 3 study uh, that included patients with stage 3 and stage 4 melanoma. And a subtle point that I won't really get into but um, is is an important one for, for these sort of older studies in melanoma is the staging system that they use. So it's the um, AJCC 7th edition, which is the current edition at the time. I think it was updated in 2018 or thereabouts. Um so a few subtle differences in the inclusion criteria, but we are talking the majority of patients having metastatic melanoma. So we're dealing with stage four regardless. Um, all of them were ECOG zero to one. So functionally fit as every um, trial patient tends to be or has to be. Uh, the median age is quoted at 60, but the vast majority of patients were less than 65, which again fits with uh, patients that, uh, that uh, we see with melanoma they are usually around sort of the 50, 60 mark in my experience, but, you know, you do get that full gamut of patients. You have patients who get it when they're 90, you get have patients when they get it when they're 20. Um, but the, the median age is, is there about 60. Uh, the majority of patients um, had uh, what's called M1C disease, which is disease, uh, metastatic disease that is non-lung. So in the AJCC, um, you have uh, M0, uh, which is no metastases, uh, M1A, which I believe is 
uh, lymph node metastases, M1B, which is lung metastases, and M1C, which is non-lung. Um, uh, the most problematic, of course, being uh, brain metastases, which affected a, a little under 5% of patients. Uh, they did do some exploratory analysis on PDL1 um, status. The PDL1 is one of the targets for immunotherapy, and it uh, is not something that is used in common practice, mainly because immunotherapy works so well. And I don't think there's really much evidence that PDL1 actually has a, 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 a value as a biomarker because we just give it to everybody, and you know, there's a good chance that it works. Um, the structure of this study is is a bit complex, so. It, uh, and that's largely down to the fact that it had three arms, arms that I'll refer to for, for ease of uh, description as arm A, arm B, and arm C from now on. So, so original. I know, I know, so original. Again, I, I didn't come, I, I came up with this myself. I didn't steal it. Uh, Is it common, Michael, to have multiple arm trials? It, I guess, depends on what you're actually um looking at. So phase three studies, as many of our listeners will know, is is stereotypically a new intervention versus standard of care. The thing with the Checkmate 067 is this was sort of a bit atypical in that there was phase two evidence that immunotherapy worked and worked quite well. Um, and there were sort of, I believe, early rumblings that this might completely change the face of, of melanoma treatment. And so there really is no control arm. There's no pegylated interferon. The closest you could get is probably arm C, which is uh, ipilimumab by itself, which I believe before this this trial was the closest thing or was, was the genesis of immunotherapy and had been used a little bit in melanoma. Um, but it is... It is the way, and I think it is the intent of this study in that it's it eventually does uh, completely revolutionise and change that it's just sort of different permutations and combinations of the same uh, of the two same uh, of the same two drugs. Um, uh, it is something you see in other studies, uh, but generally speaking, you'll have a uh, investigation arm versus a control arm, so a little bit unusual there. Um, so um, A, B, and C. Uh, arm B is the one that we're really going to talk about the most um, just for practicality because B is the one that ends up being standard of care. B is the one that ends up winning. Um, so arm A is uh, nivolumab plus placebo. Um, and the, I'll, I'll mention the dosing as well. We don't normally mention dosing on this podcast because, you know, it's it's uh, not relevant to the overall discussion, but it is here uh, because nivolumab in RMA was given a, th- uh, a dose of three milligrams per kilogram every two weeks. And there was a matching placebo to keep it blinded. In arm B, this is the combination arm. This is nivolumab at one milligram per kilogram every three weeks. Uh, and then ipilimumab, three milligrams per kilogram every three weeks, uh, followed by nivolumab maintenance, um, which is where they drop the IPI because IPI is the, is the harder, more toxic of the two, and then go on with nivolumab. Um, and so that's the winner. And But the dosing is important because when people say, uh, I'm dosing IPI nevo at the melanoma dose, that's what they mean. Three milligrams of IPI per kilogram, one milligram of nevo per kilogram. Uh, and then arm C was three milligrams per kilogram of ipi, ipilimumab, three weekly, plus placebo. And so you have these three arms being compared um, to one another. And the uh, stratification was uh, by tumor pd one status, BRAF mutation status, which I know Josh will talk about in greater depth, as well as the metastasis stage, which I mentioned before. And the treatment continued until disease progression, until it stopped working. Primary endpoints, so what the study was looking at was progression-free survival, time that the uh, immunotherapy had a demonstrable effect before the cancer grew, and then overall survival. Now, as would become sort of common knowledge uh, later, but is is sort of uh, uh, first hinted at here at the discrepancy between the numbers that we'll get, PFS uh, PFS with immunotherapy is not really a good marker. And there's a couple of reasons for that, the reasons that I can adequately explain um, because, you know, I'm not a, a, a primary statistician or immunologist. Um, not yet. That, not, not yet. Just give me another 10 or 20 decades. Um, but, <laughs> um, but 
immunotherapy does take um, uh, longer to work than chemotherapy, obviously not relevant here. But what you will see in a lot of um, trials that combine or that compare chemotherapy and immunotherapy in some combination, you'll see that the chemotherapy works um, better in the first couple of months before the immunotherapy starts to kick in. And you'll see a crossing of the curves. Um, And that um, uh, makes it very difficult to actually take um, progression-free survival seriously, I guess, because it's not a linear um, or it's not a constant difference. So the crossover means that um, the... the, um, difference between the two uh, regimens is not always the same in that one is initially better and then the other one becomes better. Uh, The other thing is that um, immunotherapy um, frequently primes the immune system and sometimes that means cancer will progress initially, but then you'll have an ongoing response. And there's also this um, uh, uh, phenomenon of pseudoprogression where the um, immunotherapy will cause the cancer to swell up as the uh, lesions are infiltrated by immune cells. Um, It's much like when you get a cut and the tissue around the cut swells up because fluid and immune cells are infiltrating the area so that the um, healing can take place. So if you scan someone too early when they're on immunotherapy, sometimes um, it can look like they've progressed when they haven't. Um, So PFS is one thing, but overall survival is really the meat of this. The secondary endpoints were um, overall response rate, pd one expression, and safety. So in terms of the initial um, data, so this is the first publication, um, the PFS uh, in arm A, the Nevo alone group, was 6.9 months. In arm C, the IPI alone group, it was 2.9 months. And then you can sense that I'm building to something here. Um, B is uh, 11.5 months. So we're looking at almost double the next best treatment for the combination of IPI and NEVO. The overall survival followed a similar pattern. Um, A was 43%. So 43% of patients had a centrally um, uh, uh, centrally sort of certified, centrally assessed uh, response, a shrinkage in their um, tumor burden. Uh, um, C was 19%. Um, B, again, coming out on top, 57% or 58%. Um, tumor responses, uh, again, uh, and I'll just talk talk about arm B, I guess, from here on in because it's it's the relevant one. So in pd one positive patients, 72% of patients had a tumor response. In pd one negative patients, 55% of patients. So there is a, a, a bit of a difference there, but I think clinical practice has, has borne out the fact that it's not significant, it's not consistent. So that so we don't test for pd one routinely in, um, in melanoma as we do in, say, lung cancer. Um, Looking at treatment-related adverse events, and, you know, some people might say, well, if you're not giving someone chemo, where do the, where do the side effects come from? We've all uh, seen in some form or of another. Um, I often use the, the example of Breaking Bad where you've got those scenes where Walter White is hunched over the toilet puking his guts out um, because he's had chemo. Um, but where do the side effects come from with immunotherapy? And basically it's... Uh, medication-induced autoimmunity. So it's the immune system that is so jazzed up, so hyped and, you know, being targeted against the cancer, but it's also being targeted at perfectly good um, perfectly good tissue as well, non, non-cancerous tissue. And so you have um, entities that are in many ways functionally indistinguishable from a primary autoimmune condition like autoimmune hepatitis or autoimmune encephalitis or those sorts of things. Um, but obviously the impetus has been the drug. So treatment related adverse events in group B, the most common ones, and anyone who's used IPI will probably not be surprised. The most common one was diarrhea. IPI is notorious for causing diarrhea. It's notorious for causing quite bad colitis as well. Um, in extreme cases, you even need to treat it like, um, uh, autoimmune ulcerative colitis uh, or, or inflammatory bowel disease and give people infliximab when they don't respond to steroids. In Hey, Mike, for those who don't know what colitis is, um, do you want to just kind of briefly... Colitis, colitis, of course, is uh, the inflammation of the bowel, inflammation of the large colon. 
Um, and sometimes uh, it is a pan colitis, so inflammation of the whole bowel. Um, and I had a case just to sort of um, uh, go on a tangent, but I had a case who, uh, of a patient who had had IPI, uh, full melanoma, had um, colitis that ended up needing infliximab, um, the, uh, what is it, the TNF-alpha um, antagonist, the, the uh, immunosuppressing agent that basically switches, switches off the colitis. And we did a PET scan on him. And because the PET scan also um, picks up inflammation, um, the entire bowel was lit up um, perfectly anatomically. So it was like you were looking at an anatomical textbook where the bowel had just been coloured in in black marker. It was it was quite interesting. Can I can I just ask out of curiosity in a case of this? So the person had colitis. You gave infliximab, right? Mm, yeah. And then you did a PET scan. Whilst... Uh, no, we we did the PET scan before. Oh, bef- was this before, before you the inf- had colitis? Yes, it was before we knew they had colitis and it was before we gave them infliximab. Okay. Because the other thing was whether they had progressed. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, so diarrhea is the most common um, treatment-related adverse event. 44% of patients had it. The other ones, and this is sort of, uh, de- um, I guess, uh, representative of pretty much all immunotherapy in terms of the commonality of side effects. The next two are fatigue at 35% and pruritus or dermatological toxicity, skin toxicity at 33%. So you have um, three of the most common immune mediated or immune related adverse events, IRAEs. Um, 55% of people had grade three events. So it is, a, or it can be a fairly toxic treatment. And, and, and we know this. Um, but it is you know, the, the treatment, um, benefits, are obviously mind blowing. So the, yes, Josh is doing his mind blowing, um, uh, uh, visualization here. Um, the most recent publication, the most recent published update I can find of this was a six and a half year update. So that in itself is extraordinary, uh, amongst oncology because really you only get that sort of survival in studies for early breast cancer, maybe early colorectal cancer, but very few, um, uh, very few studies, regardless of the therapy, just because of the nature of cancer, even get to six and a half years. So the fact that we're still following up patients um, at six and a half years is just extraordinary. Um, one, uh, one thing I, I might just add to that is that we're talking about in the metastatic setting. So people who have curative treatment, we, we probably have a lot more data on the six and a half year follow up, but just those that have, you know, widespread organ involvement and problems. So yeah, long term data is really difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it is starting to challenge our um, assessment and everyone who's ever had a conversation about oncology um, or, you know, whether it's a patient, family member or anyone, a uh, health physician with who, who's had a conversation with someone about metastatic disease, it, they have been told, or they should have been told, that it is incurable. It's treatable. We can control things, but it is incurable. And this is really the first study that I'm aware of. I don't know about you, Josh, but it's the first study that I'm aware of that has challenged that that mode of thinking that, you know, you've got stage four, the gate is open, the horse is bolted, there's nothing we can do to get it back. We just need to try and keep it under wraps for as long as we can, but eventually this is going to get you. Um, This is the first time where we're actually using around, throwing around, not throwing around, but but starting to use the C word cure for patients with metastatic disease. Yeah, I think you're right. I think also as oncologists, it's it's so difficult because, you know, we have treatment options, but treatment, you're right, it doesn't mean cure. And I guess it's kind of having those conversations that we can maintain your quality of life and, you know, you can go overseas and keep working if you want to and raise a family. But ultimately cancer becomes smart and resistant to our treatment. But melanoma, it's it's a different ball game. It is actually a different way of thinking and this is what every specialist and every researcher wants for their cancer or tumor strain yeah it really is the holy grail of oncology like we're we're 
getting pretty damn good at managing cancer that's detected early. Um, you know, surgical uh, surgical colleagues doing the the majority of the legwork in in cutting out the cancer, but then you know us knowing the sequence and the and the um, the uh, sequence of interventions, what's needed, what's not needed, who gets the benefit from it. So if you have an early cancer where things are much better, they're not perfect, of course, but they're much better. But metastatic curing metastatic disease, you know, it's something that people who treat lymphoma and leukemia have been doing for years but for solid organ malignancies it's still very much the holy grail this this unattainable ideal um that is becoming or has become quite attainable in the melanoma setting um so at six and a half years the overall survival was 72 months the median overall survival was 72 months so on average Josh, you've got to help me out here. What's that? That's that's six years. Yeah, that is six years. Yeah. So on average, people are surviving six years at six and a half years. Um, 81% of patients who are still alive in cohort B had stopped treatment, presumably because they might have progressed or had toxicity at some point, and they had never received treatment, but they were still alive and still kicking at six, six and a half years. And then we have the most recent update, which um, I don't think has been formally published, but was presented at the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting in Chicago, uh, getting on to a month ago now, as of recording in July 2022. Um, And the update was that at seven and a half years, um, the melanoma specific survival, which I guess is what they're looking at now, Uh, rather than overall survival or what they were looking at in this update was 55%. And between five and seven and a half years, there had only been a 2% decrease in the percentage of patients who were alive. And what that means is that is this other marvelous cure, uh, this marvelous uh, phenomenon of immunotherapy, which is that the curves, the survival curves, the Kaplan-Meier curves, which are in every um, or pretty much every, uh, oncology paper, major oncology paper, the kaplan curves flatten. And if you look at uh, chemo or targeted therapy drugs um, and their kaplan curves, they have this sort of uh, un- unstoppable uh, drop down to zero where, you know, you start at 100% of your patients being alive and naturally, unavoidably, even though the slope might be really shallow, so the rate of of descent is slow, you're extending survival, it's all great. Eventually those curves get to zero in that every patient who is on the trial has passed away. But we're seeing in Checkmate 067 and a number of other immunotherapy studies as well, so we think it's a a, 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 um, characteristic of immunotherapy writ large, is that the curves get down to a certain point and then flatten out. So no further patients or very few further patients are dying generally after two years. So if you can make it to two years, um, you have a very good chance of having what we call a sustained response. And that's that's oncologist, oncologist jargon for basically saying, I want to say we've cured you, but I don't want to say that yet. Um, but it's getting more and more clear that, you know, these people aren't dying of their cancer, that they're not dying... Um, the, the cancer is is at very least under control and not shifting. At best, it's gone completely. Um, and I suspect that as we see more and more um, patient, or more and more updates on this Checkmate 067, uh, that, um, you know, they will have to start looking at this melanoma-specific survival because they'll have to start differentiating between patients who die of melanoma and patients who die of other causes that are a natural consequence of, of aging. I guess so. Um, so really, a a mind blowing, practice altering study in the extreme. And as I said, the the standard of care for patients who can take it because there is toxicity, but the standard of care, um, uh, sort of un, unequivocally, and you know, there's not much um, there's not much beating around the bush. There's not much qualification on this statement, which is a nice change for what we normally have to do. But the, the standard of care for patients who can take it for metastatic melanoma is ipilimumab and nivolumab. 
I was a little jealous when we when we divvied up the the trials, and I'm like, you get to do Ippy Noob, I get to do it for the next one. But I'm like, ah, oh, the, the targeted therapy, like it's it's good, but it, it's just not as exciting. There's a there was a story recently from from the most recent ASCO about a, a, the um, new thing in in breast cancer about uh, you know being presented at the ASCO meeting. It's a very exciting drug which I won't go into, but you know standing ovation at the presentation. Pe- you know oncologists and researchers having tears of happiness in their eyes. And I'm and, and reading this study, I'm just thinking uh, if, if that's what you get for for this other um, study, which which you know is is on its own merits fantastic. God, the people who who saw this data and continue to see this data must must just be losing their minds. I think they are. I think they would be, especially you know when when you're a researcher and this or a clinician, this is all you want for your patients. It's you know because essentially retire a happy person. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know on, oncology is as uh, as I'm sure anyone who has done it will agree is occasionally, uh, frequently a very very hard specialty you know the the wins quote unquote are, uh, are rare and the and they tend to be very qualified like you know we we maintain this patient's quality of life but you know take bringing a patient back from the brink and curing them of a previously incurable and let's face it really really nasty disease like as far as cancers go melanoma is aggressive it makes beelines for the brain it's a really, really horrible cancer to have, and it's a really, really horrible way to die. And so, the fact that we have this fantastic treatment is, is, you know, it, it comes back to what we were saying before with those old crusty oncologists who were saying like it really was the dark ages, and now we're in the age of enlightenment, the age of immunotherapy. So, exactly. So, look, I, I might get started with my. I'll pass cool the baton way. to you. <laughs> Just said, look, mine's going to be brief because I think, you know, we've actually spoken about what is the most important trial here. Um, but luckily, I do have a five-year outcome. Mine's, uh, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a five-year outcome of targeted therapy or dibrafenib and trametinib in metastatic, no, metastatic melanoma. Now, you know, Michael's already kind of spoken about a lot of the, the mechanisms, but essentially this targeted therapy stops cell line pathways. So it's a BRAF and MEK targeted therapy that essentially if you stop those, you can stop the progression of melanoma. Now, I guess the one thing to say is that immunotherapy is probably more effective than targeted therapy with fewer toxicities. Um, that's just based on my experience and also sort of the readings we do. Um, and so I'm going to try and, I guess, race through this and give the pertinent points. So this particular trial was a, con- this particular study was a combination of two trials. So they were both phase three. It was called Combi D. So that's C-O-M-B-I, like a combi van, um, D and Combi V, V for Victor. And so what is a combi trial- van, Josh? For, for the listeners who don't know what a combi van is. Combi van, you know, like 1970s VW, you know, you go to the beach, you know, van life, that sort of stuff. That's a combi van, isn't it? I'm, I'm glad you uh, you clarified that. That's a very important point. I could potentially just edit this out because I don't know if anyone wants to hear that. But anyway, so, so these trials, they looked at efficacy and tolerability um, of this drug and they compared it to a single BRAF inhibitor. So what we also know is that with these trials, if you only use a single agent, there are cell line, there are, you know, um, bypassing mechanisms. So they become less effective. But look, just to summarize the previous pulled outcome at three years. So the three year rate of progression free survival and overall survival was 23%. And that's for PFS and 44% for overall survival. So when we're talking about these specific trials, Combi D primary endpoint was PFS, secondary endpoint was overall survival and all the other stuff we want to know, like response rate, duration of response, safety, pharmacokinetics, etc. Combi V, primary endpoint was a little different. So this one was overall survival and secondary endpoint was PFS, response rate, blah, blah, blah. You kind of get the deal. It's the same thing. So what they found at the five-year marks with the pooled analysis. So out of the 563 patients that had been randomized, disease progression or death happened in 74%. So about 25% of patients were still alive at that five-year mark. 
Median PFS, so progression free survival, was 11.1 months. Um, and PFS was 21% at four years and 19% at five years. Interesting enough, and I thought this was kind of cool. So we use other sort of markers with our cancers and things like LDH, you know, BRAP mutation status, which is obviously you need to use these drugs. But for those that um, have a normal lactate dehydrogenase, the PFS was actually better at the five-year mark than those that had it elevated initially. Maybe it's something to do with the aggressiveness of the cancer. I'm not sure. Other factors that they found in their subgroups that actually showed better survival included if they were older, female, BRAF V600E genotype, better performance status, which kind of you know is a given, um, and fewer metastatic, metastatic sites of disease. So when looking at overall survival for these trials, um, so median overall survival is 25.9 months. Mind you, this is a five-year update. But even so, you can kind of see that I think you know, melanoma already had beaten that at, at that point. Um, so overall survival, 37% were alive at four years and 34% at five years. And then they sort of saw, like Michael was saying with the Kappa My curves, that these curves plateaued from the three to five year um, mark. So there is something in saying that once you kind of get past what I call the danger zone, you know, the first couple of years of are you going to progress, you've probably got a pretty high chance of still being alive at that five years, which is amazing. You know, these are people who finished their, their year of treatment, so it's a year of treatment, and they've just done really well. Um, when we look at rates of response, that's another thing to talk about, which is important. So objective response, so how many people in the cohort that were treated had a response? So it's like taking Panadol, does your headache get better? How many people have a you do the headache go away. So now 68% had a complete response, uh, which, sorry, 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 objective response rate was 68%, and those that had a complete response was about 19%. Okay. Um, so that was really interesting. Now, when we're looking at PFS, so progression free survival according to best response, and they kind of work this out. So if you had a complete response, so you've got no cancer left with this treatment versus a partial response where things shrunk versus stable disease unexpectedly or expectedly actually, you know, at the five-year mark from those who had a complete response, half of the patients, about 49%, had still ongoing progression-free survival, meaning they hadn't progressed on with cancer. Now, overall, so this overall survival, according to best response, you know, if they had a really good response initially or complete response, 71% were alive at the five-year mark versus 32% of those who had partial response and only 16% who had stable disease. So there were toxicities. And I think this is the thing that a lot of people probably err towards immunotherapy these days versus, you know, targeted therapy, you know, dibrafenib, trametinib, BRAF inhibitors. Is that it can be toxic. Um, so 98% of patients had some form of adverse event and about 18% had discontinuation due to toxicities. Most common include pyrexia, which is itch, itchiness. So pyrexia, sorry, is fever. Um, pruritus is, is itchiness. So I can edit that. But pyrexia, um, about sort of, a, I think it was, what was they saying? So pyrexia, decreased ejection fraction. So your heart's not pumping as well and increased liver enzymes as well. Now, this particular five-year update didn't talk that much about toxicities, but I've actually gone into one of the specific trials here just because I think it's worthwhile talking a little bit more about it. And so this is the, um, oh gosh, which was this? It was, it was one of them. It was, I'm going to look this up and then edit it. I don't know if it was Combi V or Combi D. Um, either way, it was, you know, Dibrafenib and Tremendib versus single agent. Um, and what they found, you know, interesting enough, those that had Dibrafenib and Placebo, had more overall toxicities than those in the combination arms. That was really quite interesting. But chills, pyrexia fatigue, rash, nausea were all relatively common with 20% or more patients having some form of toxicity. Um, and for those that have had nausea, especially with treatment, it can be exceptionally debilitating um, as well. But I guess the thing is, and Michael and I were chatting about this prior to our um, prior to our actual uh, podcast is like, you know, gold standard would say is probably immunotherapy, 
you can potentially use this if someone progresses because there's ongoing questions about you know how effective is um how effective is retrialing with immunotherapy i mean the other thing we also have to ask is how effective are these treatments after immunotherapy because this this drug you know this, this treatment or these trials are actually used they weren't used in a, in a in a world where we'd already been pre-treated with immunotherapy and so i think that's something important to kind of flag um now one of the things to look about in the combi d and combi v trial so patients who've received other treatments so so post-treatment anti-cancer type about i think about it's almost 60 percent went on to have immunotherapy that's the ones that progressed in this trial because quite a few did um and that's probably really the summary of the combi v and combi d trials is that look it does work there are benefits to it but i think you know the toxicities are something you have to think about and from a personal kind of you know working in healthcare i've seen some people who like they're like look josh I, i've had the targeted therapy and it was shocking you know debilitating you know just no quality of life and then they switch across to the immunotherapy and they're like what's going on I, I have no side effects or why why is this the case um so i think michael maybe maybe you can attest to that too that people generally tolerate immunotherapy better than these drugs yeah i think i completely agree with you um josh i think the other thing that people frequently complain about with specifically dibrafenib and trametinib or dab tram as it's known to the cool kids um is is the pyrexia which you mentioned and it is when it's bad those pyrexic um episodes these these fevers apropos of nothing um are really uh, you know beyond irritating that they're, they're debilitating people feel unwell that all of our patients are told that if they have a fever they need to come to hospital because they could be immunosuppressed and need antibiotics and the rest of it so exactly. so so you know, I've, I've seen a few people on dibrafenib and trametinib, um, not as many as, as one would expect given the, the outcomes that, you know, it's a, a case of timing where Dabtram came about out around the same time as immunotherapy and it's just like, oh, damn, if we'd come five or 10 years earlier, we would have been much more successful. Um, but specifically with dibrafenib, trametinib, the, um, the pyrexial, um, episodes can be really, really bad. I think with immunotherapy as well, it, it is one of those things where, you know, we say 30% of patients will have, or 30 to 40% of patients will have some uh, form of side effects and generally about 10 to 15% of patients will have significant side effects, but only 5% will have really bad side effects. The problem is when immunotherapy goes bad, it goes really bad. Right. Um, so, 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 I mean, it, you, you're sort of, uh, playing the numbers here in that you're less likely to have bad side effects with immunotherapy, but you are, but if you do have bad, bad side effects, it can be, it can be fatal, which I don't think you can say for dab tram. It's debilitating. Yes. Fatal, less likely. Yeah. I mean, the, and you're right about the timing. Like this, one of the trials, um, was literally, collecting patients between 2012 and 2015. So you're, you're essentially right in that time, just as they're getting preparing to release all the immunotherapy data and, you know, the world changing outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. It's like inventing the typewriter uh, a day before Steve, Steve Jobs comes out with a, with an iMac or something. <laughs> yeah, sure. That that's doing, that's doing dab tram a disservice. It's a very good treatment, but it's, um, it, it would have been better if it hadn't been competing with immunotherapy. I think that's that's not a controversial thing to say. Yeah, but still much better than uh, chemotherapy and interferon. Yeah, this is yeah. this has turned into the interferon punching bag episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess I, I guess Josh, you know, we I guess we've pretty much answered the question that I was going to ans ask you. But this this is a treatment that is only for patients with um, BRAF mutations, specifically the BRAF V600E, I think is the one that was mainly looked at. Um, but if, if you have a patient with metastatic melanoma in front of you, who is young, fit, able to take whatever you throw at them, they have the BRAF mutation, which isn't uncommon. I forget the, I forget the exact incidence at this point, but, um, you know, it's common enough that, uh, BRAF and MEK is, is uh, frequently an option. What uh, what are you going to reach for first? 
immunotherapy or BRAF? And, you know, we've sort of answered that question anyway. Look, yeah, it is going to be immunotherapy because if they're young and they've got other responsibilities, you're like, you can, you can work, you know, you can continue in your running group or do whatever it is that you do with your life and you're coming with an infusion once every three weeks and when you drop down to a single agent you know potentially you can even increase that to what once a month when you double the double dosing um Mm. and like that that's amazing like two Mm. years of treatment you can live a relatively normal life Mm. and and that's that's very much you know the the emotional um uh, response and 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 I agree with you. It's definitely the correct response. But un- unlike um, many other of these comparisons, where we say, "Oh, you can't compare two separate trials because they have two separate um, populations, and there's going to be confounding factors, and everyone looks at you uh, crossly <laughs> if you try if you if you try and do that." But we actually do have um, uh, randomized data that is comparing treatment naive patients with BRAF mutations. Um, mm-hmm. It's the DreamSec or ECOG Akron EA6134 um, trial, which we'll also include in the description, um, that actually compared patients who had, who had never been treated um, and randomised them to receive Ipinevo or Dabtram. Um, and then patients who progressed were offered the alternative regimen. So there's what we call crossover. And that, you know, put, puts... Put, I, I, I do like the the study design and we're not going to go into it in in depth, but um, I do like the study design because it reflects what would happen in real life. And yeah. and, and, and the patients who got immunotherapy first uh, at two years um, did better. The two-year overall survival was 72% versus 52%. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it got to the point where the trial was stopped early because it would be... Um, you know, unethical to continue a trial where the answer is is well, uh, it's a foregone conclusion, and you're giving a proportion of patients a treatment that you know is inferior. So, so we have this, you know, this this uh, this pie in the sky sort of we can cure you. This is the best thing since sliced bread and Betty White type thing um, with immunotherapy. I do love Betty White. Uh yeah, bless bless her bless her soul. Bless us all. Yeah. Um, but but we have we have this you know these great potentials, but we also do have hard data, which again you know we're, we're talking about melanoma being the the final frontier um, of of uh, you know oncology treatment, um, and this is something else that we don't frequently see, which is a head to head study between two demonstrably very good treatments, and then yeah. of course only only one comes out on top. And maybe I painted a slightly mean picture of Debtran, but look, I think the other thing to note is that it's still a treatment and it's still a viable treatment option that if someone is on immunotherapy and they do progress and they've got this mutation, I, no one would question you if you're like, let's try this second line treatment of Debtran because... Oh, absolutely. And and you would be, you know, barring obvious contraindications, you'd be foolish not to um, yeah, try this sort of... Um, because it can improve things beyond immunotherapy and... Um, you know, once you have immunotherapy, at least at this stage, that's it. You, you can't you can't get it again if you progress. At least in Australia. At least in Australia, and but but the the concept of um, of rechallenging immunotherapy is is an emerging one, shall we say, charitably. It's not yeah. something that is that has a lot of weight behind it. So I guess I guess to to summarize it, uh, melanoma is is a cancer that has gone from. Uh, one of the worst cancers to have to definitely one of the most treatable. Zero to hero. Zero to hero, absolutely. Um, and uh, if you have a patient in front of you who has uh, has uh, um, metastatic melanoma, we'll talk about adjuvant in a later episode, but uh, metastatic melanoma um, who is a good performance status, reach for the immunotherapy first and have the BRAF inhibitors in reserve. Mm-hmm. That's an unusual, hap- unusually happy conclusion for our podcast, Josh. Yeah, it's great. It's always nice to have one. Yeah, we have them once in a blue moon. <laughs> All right, well, we might uh, wrap it up there. This has been Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind. Thanks very much, Josh, for your insight, as always. Thanks for having me. And uh, we'll catch you all next time. Goodbye. See you later.